It's a real pleasure to be here. I've already had some amazing conversations with uh, not only faculty, but also the students in Emily's class. Uh, my very good friends, uh, Jeff Niederdepi and Ruth Humphrey, or, uh, that's their daughter now, Lee Humphreys. Uh, I'm also good friends with their little daughter, Ruth. She's three. Um, they are alumni here, of course. They did their PhDs here, and they warned me about how harsh and critical the questions can be. They didn't tell me that they make the temperature really cold and don't serve food. So I'm impressed how uh, hard you guys make it. This is really great. Um, so I'm excited today to talk about uh, some of the emotional work. As Emily said, I do a lot of work on deception uh, and, and how it intersects with new technology. So happy to talk to people about that afterwards. But today, I want to talk about uh, something that's been motivating me and my group for uh, about five or six years. And this is a talk that I started putting together um, uh, last spring before uh, the controversy erupted around uh, the Facebook emotional manipulation study. So just very quickly, how many of you have heard of the Facebook manipulation? Okay, it's a friend number. Yeah, great. So yeah, it turns out that uh, people have heard about that, including my wife's family, who uh, two weeks after the whole thing happened, we were at a family reunion and they cornered me in a pool to ask me about that. It's very strange having to defend your work in swimming trunks. Um, so that anything you say to me today, no problem compared to that. Uh, for a long time, I really didn't like the way, uh, or I found a, a, one of the ways that the uh, media portrays social media to be really problematic. Uh, there's a, a real sort of view of, of social media as trivial, uh, as narcissistic, as um, being really problematic too, leading to depression and, and, um, and, and sort of this like uh, atomized society. Now, that's a popular view, and I, uh, I really felt in a lot of our work that we were not seeing the same thing there. And of course, popular views can be kind of like straw man. So I want to show you some examples of just a few other academic papers that um, also have this sort of view of, uh, of size. So we see a lot of work around um, uh, happiness and that people that use social media are more or less happy, that there's social comparison effects on Facebook. You know, you, everything's very positive. So we see these positive things, and it makes us feel bad because we don't like it when other people do well. That's the sort of idea. Um, and then this, uh, this paper here, which showed you know, a fairly small sample, 80 people, that the more they used Facebook at any given uh, time period, the next time period, they were less happy. Okay? So it's not only a popular view, but it's also something that is coming out a lot in the literature. <coughs> in our group, we're seeing very different kinds of effects um, with uh, online communication. That, that The reason that people, uh, students, for example, when they leave my class, immediately jump on uh, um, social media of various kind isn't necessarily an addiction or a problematic thing, but that it might serve some psychological function. And so we started to take a look at this idea of affordances. A, affordances is a, 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 a perceptual theory, of course, it started at Cornell. We've sort of adapted that to design and to the way people might take advantage of different media features to accomplish psychological functions. So that's what we're going to do today walk you through a couple of studies. We're going to look at three different psychological kind of dynamics that we think could be supported by um, social media. I purposely use a very loose definition of social media. Like I don't say like some kind of media like uh, Twitter and Facebook or social media and email and texting is not. I, I think of it very loosely, purposely, that it's any technology that um, enhances our social uh, tendencies, our ability to be social. Um, so not a strong definition, but just one where I want to tell you my inclination is to be fairly loose about this. So the first thing we'll look at is self-affirmation. This is a, uh, a very well-studied phenomena in uh, psychology. Basic idea is that uh, when we're reminded of our values, our core um, beliefs, and things that we think are important to our identity, uh, we can resist uh, a lot of negative things. Uh, so for example, it's been shown that if you get self-affirmed uh, right before uh, something bad happens. You're less defensive. You're able to deal, cope with it more. So self-affirmation has been shown to help with everything to, from anger management to tobacco and smoking cessation. So it's a very powerful uh, effect. And I seem to have lost my uh, thing here. No problem. This is just part of being co the cold stuff, probably. Uh, and it's, so it's been shown to be fairly universal. And um, it's really straightforward. Uh, Claude Steele has been a big driver on this. But the basic idea is that it's around social roles, relationships, values, and identities. And Catalina Toma, who's now at Wisconsin, was my student at the time, really felt that Facebook actually allows you to accomplish a lot of these things. It's a network of who your friends are, who your family is. 
You post things about what's important to you. Um, I think AT&T wants me to join them, and that's maybe kicking me off. We'll see if that stops, and then I'll just shut the Wi-Fi off. And so um, we wanted to set about testing whether Facebook could be self-affirming or not. The self-affirmation paradigm, which has been done uh, hundreds of times in psychology, is very straightforward. Uh, you present somebody with an ego threat, and then, uh, so for instance, like, you get them to give a speech, and then you, you give them bad news about it, like, you really sucked. And then you look at whether they take in that feedback, like, was that feedback reasonable? Was that person reasonable in giving you criticism? That kind of thing. And you can measure that. And when people have ego threat, they tend to get defensive. A number of cognitive biases kick in. Self-affirmation um, allows to remove those biases or circumvent them. So when you're thinking about what's important to you in your life, and someone tells you that your speech wasn't very good because you stuttered, uh, it wasn't well organized, and you were too quiet, you listen to that and you can hear that. Because in some ways, that's not crucial. It's not about who you are. You've been reminded about what's important to you, and so it allows you to then pay attention to, um, to critical information and not be defensive. Okay? So self-affirmation after ego threat leads to reduced defensive, defensive um, biases. So what we wanted to do was see if Facebook could play this role of uh, self-affirmation and reduce um, defensiveness. So to do that, I want to go over the basic technique for self-affirming um, in psychology. You get people to write an essay about their most important values. You get them list 10 values. And then you say, OK, we want you to write about the top two. Write an essay about, or a paragraph about what's really important to you. Here's one, an actual one. Uh, from our study, they chose uh, about relationships. So I'm always comforted about my relationships, grateful that they have, I have such wonderful people in my life. That's a typical kind of self-affirming um, essay. And then the contrast is you say, OK, you've listed your top 10 things. Now take the 10th one and write about that. And so this person had included government and politics. And you can see they say, well, government and politics are probably important for other people. But for me, it's not a, a big part of my identity. So in psychology, what they do is they would get people to either write a, a values essay or a non-values essay, and that would be the self-affirmation. The one about values would be self-affirming, the other one not. What we did is we wanted to come up with a Facebook analog to that, and that was relatively easy to think about how to do that from uh, the self-affirming, so we just get people to look and review their own Facebook page, because this has all the information about their friends and their family and their identities and photos of themselves with their friends, so if we're right, then their page should be uh, self-affirming. The tricky part, and I think what was really smart, this, and I give the credit to Catalina here, was what's the control, right? So the self-affirmation data before is you know, value, top value, low value. Our control here was a yoked uh, control. So instead of viewing your own profile, you would view the profile of the person that was just in the study before you. And the reason this is a great control is now in the, in the two conditions, everybody's seen exactly the same stimulus content, right? So everybody in the study all saw the same content, but it was either yours or somebody else's, okay? So it serves as a very nice control, this yoked profile. So the way the study went is uh, they would come in, uh, they were told, given a cover story that we were looking at uh, uh, speeches, they would do a speech. While they were waiting to get feedback for it, they were offered the chance to do a different study in which it was around looking at uh, web design, in particular on Facebook. And they either got to look at their own Facebook profile, or they got the yoked control, or they did the classic Facebook manipulation or self-affirmation manipulation. So they either did their own values or not. Okay, so they've done a speech. Now they're doing another study in which they're either getting affirmed by Facebook or not, or classically or not. And then they receive in an envelope their feedback. The feedback's always negative. They did poorly. And what we're interested in then is their ratings of that feedback. How smart was the feedback? How constructive was it? How smart do you think the person is that gave it to you? If they're affirmed, they should think that the feedback was fine and take a lot out of it. If not, we should see defensive mechanisms kick in, and they will derogate the, um, the, defensive, uh, the, uh, the feedback. OK, I'm going to walk it through over here so people can't see me. I can uh, be really careful with it. This is the classic one. In white here, they've been affirmed. So they've written about their top value. And this is basically how uh, appreciative of the uh, feedback did they think it was? How good was the feedback? How accepting of that negative feedback was it? 
And we see the classic self-affirmation effect. Those that were affirmed by writing about their values uh, thought more highly of the feedback. They were more accepting of it than those that were not. Over here, exactly the same thing. They looked at their own Facebook profile or they looked at a yoked control. And you can see they're more um, accepting of it there. Importantly, there is no interaction effect. And you, know, you can look for the interaction effect in any way you want. But basically, this effect here is exactly the same as the classic one. There is no statistical difference. We tried to find it as many different ways as we can in terms of mediation, moderation, everything, uh, including looking at um, these different kinds of um, mediators that have been found in other self-affirmation. But basically, after you look at your own profile compared to looking at somebody else's, you feel more grateful, you feel more giving, loved, connected, et cetera. And that was also the case for traditional self-affirmation. So in every way we can look at it with, I think, a very nice control condition here, looking at Facebook is self-affirming in exactly the same way as writing an essay about your, your values. Okay? So this is very nice. I think it, it gives us a, an alternate sort of narrative about why people are attracted to Facebook and use Facebook that's not about addiction, narcissism, um, those sort of negative approaches. Uh, but instead, can make sense. And after a hard class or an exam, when I see students leaving and immediately going to check, they're, I think they're, self, they're going into a self-affirmation. At least that's, that's one of the affordances. Now, we did a second little follow-up study that's coming between you and the food. So good for you. It's very short. Probably good for me, too. Is We did a follow-up where um, we wanted to know if, indeed, we were right, that those students, when they're looking at their phones right after class or a hard test, are doing self-affirmation. So in this case, they give a speech, and then they get either really negative uh, feedback about that speech right away, or they get neutral feedback. And we wanted to look at where they went to go in a follow-up study. So they're told that once they're done this little mini study, we're going to be done fairly quickly. They can do another study for more credit. And we have uh, five options here for them to do this other study. They could go to their Facebook profile. They could read online news. They could play video games. They could watch YouTube videos. They could listen to online music. There are five studies taking place in the lab. It's your choice which one you'd want to get to do. And so we've had them do a speech. We uh, give them an ego threat, which is negative uh, feedback about their speech. And then we just watch to see where they went. And when they received neutral feedback about their speech, you could see that Facebook was fairly attractive. So 30% went to Facebook, and 70% went to the other. And that's slightly above what you would expect by chance. I think Facebook is very uh, attractive media for most students. But it was 30% to 69% when they received neutral feedback. After they received negative feedback, this goes up substantially. It basically doubles. So twice as many students go to Facebook after they've, been, uh, after they've received an ego threat than um, in the neutral condition. Okay? So the, this data here, and you know, obviously this difference uh, is statistically significant, suggests that after they've received an ego threat and they're given an opportunity to go to Facebook, they go there much more often than they would go to uh, Facebook if they hadn't received the ego threat. Suggesting, and actually amazingly, according to Catalina, who knows this literature much better, this is the, the first real world definition or description of some of individuals going out and getting self-affirmation. Steele actually has a number of quotes where he says that when, well, perhaps when people get threatened, they go home and they go on the internet and they look at their favorite politician, well, you know how many people do that, but or their favorite team. Uh, I mean, he did say that, but uh, your favorite team. The idea is you would go home and you'd use media to self-affirm, right? He'd speculated about that, and this is the first study to show that. Okay, so I think that this is one of the reasons. It's one of the affordances of Facebook, and it it goes in direct contrast with this idea of uh, addiction and narcissism and depression. All right, so that's self-affirmation. The um, the next thing we were interested in the lab was emotional dynamics. Uh, emotions have been studied a lot, obviously, in media. Uh, the grandfather, obviously, of emotional work, um, Paul Ekman, and here's the, some of the original photos of this idea of universal uh, facial expressions of emotion. And this had a big influence on a lot of the way psychology and communications looked at emotion. Namely, you need nonverbal 
uh, information to convey emotion. This is a very strongly held prevailing sort of assumption in a lot of communication work. When people are asked, why does email lead to fights or why did flaming wars exist in the 90s, typically the answer was because there's no nonverbal cues. And I think this is really deeply wrong. I think actually the reason that misunderstandings occur in email uh, has nothing to do with nonverbal um, behavior. And that, in fact, we're able to communicate emotion without these. Uh, anybody that's read, say, Shakespeare, for example, should have some sense that text can convey emotion. Uh, but indeed, we, we can look at, um, at Twitter around the world. So this is my colleague, Michael Macy, and his student, Scott Golder, published this in Science. And uh, they looked at 550 million um, tweets time locked around the world. And what you can see here is up at the, the top is positive affect words. And uh, each color band is, is a day. And we're going across the, the day, OK? So this is midnight, morning, afternoon, evening, and midnight again, OK? And these are the number of times uh, a positive affect word, happy, great, awesome, occurred in, in the tweet as a percentage. So higher uh, here means there were more positive affect words. And can anybody recognize what this rhythm is? It matches exactly with a circadian rhythm. And so they argue this is the first um, cross-cultural uh, uh, description of circadian rhythms. The negative affect is the exact opposite. So you see the most negative affect when people are awake when they shouldn't be, according to the circadian rhythm. And it also increases during the post-lunch dip, which you'll all experience very soon. Um, and people get happiest when they're about to go out and see people, and they're very happy in the morning. So at scale, uh, I believe that language reflects emotions. At the individual level, I could say to you right now, happy, and we, that would, according to this, would get coded. I'd get upticked as producing more positive language. I'm not necessarily more happy. So at the individual level, especially at the individual message level, it's a very, very, very loose correlation between actual affect and my language. At scale, when you're looking at 500 million tweets, for example, the error there is overcome and that loose correlation emerges. Okay, so that's how I view it. I do believe that what I say is related to my actual uh, interior uh, feelings and cognitions, but loosely. Okay, so we can see emotion. It can be expressed in text here, even short texts. And we were interested in emotional contagion. We started off looking at uh, how do people express emotion in text. And it turns out very easily they, uh, they say no less often, for example. We then started looking at whether people could detect emotions in text. So we would make people feel really happy, or we'd make them feel really sad, talk to somebody, and then see if the other person could detect it. They did it really easily, like 85 90% accuracy. Then we got interested in something a little more subtle, which is emotional contagion. The idea here is that the way I feel will uh, change somewhat the way you're all feeling. And the classic example is if you've ever walked into a room and you can tell like everybody's super tense. And it makes you tense immediately, right? So emotional contagion, like emotion in general, has been thought to be mediated non-verbally. Facial expressions, non-verbal cues like the body movement, perhaps pheromones, but certainly not through language. So we did a test to look at whether it was through language or not. We've done a number of these. I'm going to show you our most sort of harshest experiment in order to prepare you for the Facebook study. Um, in this one, we look at neg the, the contagion of negative affect. This is the um, procedure. I'm going to step you through it for um, the uh, experiment where we take three people and we have one of them become really uh, experience real negative affect and talk to two people that don't experience negative affect and see if they get it. Here's how it works. They, they go to uh, Mike Shapiro's uh, lab where they watch a movie where they're thinking it's about movies, and that's what the study is. They watch this one, which is a scene from uh, My Bodyguard about bullying. It's really awful. People feel terrible afterwards. Or they watch a relatively, well, actually insanely boring and very, very neutral affect movie uh, that I like. You know, it's perfectly neutral. And, um, and then those people take uh, PNAS to get a sense of what their current um, feelings are. Now this person, we, we then would get them to talk about tips for surviving freshman year. What we found in our pilot studies was that these people who felt awful after talking to somebody in the chat room, when we measured them after talking, they felt totally fine. And this effect is pretty common. Actually, it's called the talking therapy. In terms of if you feel bad, just talk to somebody else and you'll feel better. So we had to keep them feeling bad. To do that, we played some of my favorite heavy metal. I think Bruce would know Mastodon. We played Mastodon. 
and uh, on their headphones. And then they had to solve anagrams to angry, malice, funeral, coffin, really uh, negative uh, anagrams. And this is, these techniques are standard in the emotional contagion literature. So they're typing, they're talking to this other person, they have heavy metal coming in, they're solving really negative anagrams. And we keep them in the negative affect state. And then afterwards, we check and see how they're feeling. These people here, feeling neutral, everything's fine, I'm doing tips. And they get to listen to neutral jazz, elevator type music, and they solve very neutral primes. Okay? In the fully controlled condition, so that's a group of three. In the con oh, sorry, right. I okay. In the, uh, in the control condition, uh, the control condition, everybody experiences the, the neutral thing. So you can see here, everybody's watching a perfectly boring movie, and they're listening to uh, Winston Marsalis, which is actually pretty boring jazz, too. Okay? Now the question is, uh, first of all, did we make them feel bad? So yes, we did. We're looking at the Panas scale there. Negative emotion goes up. Sorry, my uh, air bars are off there. And the key question in this experiment is, do the partners, the people that were getting neutral feeling affect stimulus, do they look more like the other people in the control condition that were experiencing the exact same stimulus environment, or do they look more like the person experiencing the negative affect? Okay, so the question is, what they should do is look exactly like these people. If emotional contagion took place, then they should move towards what the experiencer felt. Okay? And now we're looking at the um, Russell affect circumplex here. And geez, I don't know what's going on there. Okay, so what we wanted to find was a difference between the partners of the experiencer and the control. And in fact, we find that. Okay? This is a very small effect. If I were to go back to look at the P value is 0.03 or 4, but the D value here is, is really small. And I think that's really important to know because we used a manipulation hammer of negative affect to make this per person over here feel really bad. And their partner, communicating with them directly through text, changes. The emotional contagion occurs, but it's very slight. Okay. So that's a controlled experiment, very tight in our lab. Um, Facebook uh, was really interested in their emotional dynamics in networks as well. Adam Kramer had been doing a work on emotional um, dynamics in social networks. And they'd been following our work since we were the first people to look at emotional dynamics like this in text. They were following ours and replicating some of them. And um, they wanted to do a study to find out what was going on in the news feed because they had seen some social comparison effect studies coming out, two of them in 2011, that showed that because Facebook has mostly positive posts, it was leading people to feel that everybody else's life was better than theirs, and it was, it was depressing them. So this was upward social comparison. They were looking up at people that were feeling better than them and making them depressed. Facebook data science team was looking at this thinking, this is a problem. Facebook's most valuable asset is the news feed, and if the news feed is depressing people, then that's not good because it's going to lead to less engagement. Less engagement means less clicking. Less clicking means less advertising revenue. So it would actually directly affect their bottom line. So they designed this experiment that I'm going to show you. As they were designing it, Adam wrote and said, you want to be involved in this? I think it's, it's related to emotional contagion. And I said, yes, I think that sounds fascinating. And I can't believe you can do this kind of study um, at scale, et cetera. So I'm going to walk you through it. But that's how this came to be. The study was going to happen because they were interested in their emotional dynamics. So here's what the newsfeed looked like at the time. And um, what Facebook was proposing to do was uh, withhold posts from somebody's newsfeed that contained a negative affect word, as calculated by what you know, Golder and Macy was using. We use It's a dictionary called Luke. Um, and it would run on this, and it would say, OK, this person here has, on average, people have about 1,500 posts that they could be served by Facebook in their newsfeed. News uh, Facebook tries to reduce that down to, say, the 30 most engaging and interesting for that user, according to what they think. So it's already algorithmically being curated. What they would do then is, OK, so here's the 30 that we think we should serve this person. And if any of them had a negative affect word, there was some probability that it would be removed from that loading of the news feed. The next loading of the news feed, that one that had been uh, hidden from the news feed before, would be back in play. So the idea was they were uh, removing negative affect from a person's news feed at some percentage. It varied anywhere from 10% to 90%. Uh, to, um, uh, to make this newsfeed have very little or much less negative affect in it. Okay? 
Over here in the other experimental uh, uh, condition, this is the most controversial one, they remove positive affect uh, posts. So posts with a positive affect word would then get removed at some probability from that person's newsfeed for that loading of the newsfeed. Does that make sense for everybody? Okay. Now, uh, this is important. It turns out that uh, there's many, many, many more positive affect worded posts on Facebook, about five times as many as negative. So we also uh, looked at these um, other two conditions where they randomly withheld from that algorithmically curated list a post. Okay, so here they would remove uh, from that viewing a similar number of posts from the algorithmically curated list as the negative posts. And then here they would do the same, but it was matched to the rate for positive. So this is about five times more things were removed uh, than, than here. Okay, and then the comparison is not negative to positive, but here we're looking at here to here. So I think the control obviously is often not thought about here, but it's actually really critical to interpreting the results. The emotional contagion prediction is that in this, in this uh, uh, condition where there's less negative being observed, so we're moving negative, we should see less negative and more positive posting by that person during the week of the experiment, okay? So they're seeing less negative, they should then produce less negative. Now many of you are probably sitting there thinking, yeah, but there's other reasons than contagion that could work. You're absolutely right. Mimicry would be a perfectly reasonable explanation here. I'm getting exposed to less negative. Therefore, you know, it could be a very mechanistic thing where I just then produce less negative. So critical for emotional contagion argument is the countervalence effect is that you should also then see more positive affect terms being produced by that person in that condition. Most work on emotional, uh, emotional dynamics now has come to the conclusion that positive affect and negative affect are not two ends of a continuum, they are orthogonal in many ways. So you can have high positive affect and high negative affect, they, are, they move independently. So if we've done this to this, to this, po to this poster, then it should have no effect on, on positive, emotion, uh, positive affect words, unless it's emotional contagion. And here, uh, there's been positive posts withheld, so we should see less positive and more negative. So um, I'll run you through the negative side. So the data are consistent. On the top part of the panel, we see that in the experimental condition where um, uh, negative words were being withheld, you're seeing them producing more positive and producing less negative, consistent with emotional contagion, compared to the random with, withheld control. And, uh, same, but vice versa, for the positive affect withheld post. So you see fewer positive affect terms being produced and more negative affect. And you can see here is the total number of words looked at for the week. So there's four and a half million to two million. So it's not quite five to one in our study, but it's a little more than two times as much. So that's it. Now, uh, hugely statistically significant, like 0 0.0001 kind of things. But I want to go over, and this is one thing that's never covered in the news media, because it's sort of a little bit difficult. Oh, maybe, did I not put it in here? Sorry. OK, it's not in here. Um, I'll go over with these effect sizes. So this is the most controversial condition. Uh, the, the hyperbole is that we depressed people because they wouldn't see any more uh, positive affect posts. So in this condition, to give you a sense of the effect size, it, the effect size was d equal to 0 0.001, right? So modified people's production of affect terms by one one thousandth of a, of a standard deviation. Now to put that into some more concrete terms, uh, the effect size here was that we reduced the number of pov positive affect words here, so they would produce um, uh, one less positive affect word for every thousand or so. And for negative words, we got them to produce uh, four more negative affect words for every 10,000 words they would write. Now, for a typical user, even a heavy user that's posting about five times to Facebook, it would take about three years to write 10,000 words in your newsfeed. So over a three-year period, roughly, you would produce four more negative affect words. That's the size of this effect. The effect is minuscule. Two really important points here. One, how could you have known in advance that this was going to be a, such a tiny effect? Well, I showed you that previous study where we hammered people 
with an emotion manipulation, and it barely shows up as an effect in emotional contagion. So we knew that this was going to be a tiny effect. Two, who gives a crap if it's so small? Why is this important? Well, this is actually a really important question for us as a field, I think, moving forward, as we start to do more and more studies where we have this kind of power. As a psychologist trained in the 90s, this kind of power is alien to me and my way of thinking, to be able to detect something so small. So does it mean that anything now is going to be significant? You can, you can always find a magnitude effect. But why theory is so important, and Sandra has done really nice writing and work on this, is why theory still matters is you cannot make a direction go your way with, with power. You can find magnitude with power, but you can't do anything with direction. And that's why, to me, theory is so important. That's why I still think this is a really nice experiment, because the theory is able to allow us to interpret these data, even though the effect size is tiny. So happy to ask, answer any of those things. I, I had put some slides in about the uh, ethics of this study, but I'm happy to take those in question. So I'm just going to move on to the next one, which is around psychosocial support. Doing a lot of work in this area now, and I thought um, a lot of people here working in health would find this interesting. Um, what we've found so far is that using social media can be self-affirming. That has a lot of positive potential health effects. It also looks like emotions can move through text, consciously or unconsciously. And so we were interested in um, how the, you could use this as an intervention. And it came up in a weird sort of way. My wife's brother, so my brother-in-law, happens to be an anesthesiologist. And he sat in on one of our lab meetings. And afterwards, as we were having a beer, he was like, do you think we could do this in the hospital? And I was like, you know, what do you mean? He said, well, what, maybe we could do this in surgery. And I pointed out, well, when people are unconscious, there's not a lot of texting going on. And he pointed out to me that actually there's a huge movement in anesthesiology to keep people awake during as many surgeries as possible. So if you're being operated on from anywhere from about here down, they try now to keep you awake. And this is a huge movement in anesthesiology because there's recognition that anesthetics can, be, uh, can impede um, uh, recovery. So we got approval to go into his hospital and get people to text while they were being operated on. That's the long and short of it. Let me show you the design. You can see that the IRB and me are really tight friends. Um, <laughs> so uh, take a look at the top here. What we did is we, we get people to go in. They're being operated on knee surgery, hip surgery, other kinds of surgeries you don't want to know about. And they either text a friend. So this is somebody that's a loved one, a companion that's come into the hospital with them. Or they text a stranger. This is somebody that we were paying. We gave them a self-affirming transcript. So they ask questions about like what kind of movies they like and books and what, what's their family. And they either have one of those two conversations, so with a loved one, so we expected good psychosocial support there, or texting a stranger, we expected good self-affirmation effects. And they do that, they text during surgery. Um, we have a distraction task where they're with their phone and they're playing Angry Birds, and uh, they play that during surgery. Or a standard operating uh, procedure where there's no phone and they just you know, go through the surgery as expected. The um, procedure for each person, okay, yeah, I was really into highlighting. Um, so the procedures, they get randomly assigned, and we use, we're in a, in a uh, uh, health environment here, a medical environment, so random control trial procedure was used uh, very carefully. Um, measure preoperative anxiety, which I'll tell you now just doesn't play a role. Uh, they get their spinal taps of so the anesthesiologist. There were 10 of them. All but one was blind to the uh, procedure, and we separate out uh, Chris, my brother-in-law, for these results. And then they have their surgery. And what we're going to do, our dependent variable, my favorite dependent variable so far in my life, is uh, milligram intake of fentanyl. Fentanyl is a very powerful opioid. And what we want to know is, um, does texting allow them to, are they, do they need less drugs to get through the surgery, OK? So can we affect how much um, morphine, essentially, they need? All right. And then we also did a linguistic analysis of the text to friend, text to stranger to see if we could better understand what sort of psychosocial dynamics are operating if we get an effect. All right, so here's the data. Um, in the control conditions, so there's no phones involved here, they need roughly 35 micrograms, not milligrams. Sorry, you'd be toast if you did milligrams. 35 micrograms of fentanyl in the control. So this is a standard operating procedure. When the, in the distraction task, you see uh, uh, this amount. There's um, uh, some improvement over control, but it's not significant. 
Both of these conditions, text to companion and text to stranger, do better than control. So if you're texting the loved one, you're texting the stranger, you're gonna do better than control. But only texting the stranger, the person that we paid and you didn't know at all, beats distraction. And I think distraction is really the key control condition here. This is, you know, this could have distraction in it, but this really is about the psychosocial aspects, it's partially now the distraction with the control. And only the texting a stranger. You know, this, uh, when again, we had, you know, alternate hypotheses here, but I really thought that texting a companion was gonna be the winner. I really felt that by texting people, you would get some psychosocial sort of priming taking place, that you're feeling loved and connected. And so why did texting a stranger, why was it the winner? Well, we can look at the linguistic differences, and essentially what happens is the companion, so this is like how much negative emotion was in the transcripts, how much positive emotion, and you can see texting a stranger was really positive and much less negative. And uh, you're probably starting to get a sense of what's happening. I'll show you the um, other, Luke has these nice categories about biology, body, and health. And you can see that the companion is talking a lot about the body and biology and health. And so what we're seeing evidence of is essentially an anxiety feedback loop. The person that's waiting outside the surgery is like, are you okay? Oh my God, are you still okay? That must be so weird. I'm struggling. They're like, help me, come help me, please, you know? <laughs> Like, look at how much they're talking about it. And then here, uh, they're like super negative. So, so there's, I think what happened is there was the psychosocial priming that we expected matched with this anxiety feedback loop. And that's what leads us to see the change. Yeah? When you say fentanyl, higher or lower, is it automatic? Have ah. you decided how to give the fentanyl? Yeah, no, it's a really good point. So it's the anesthesiologist's job and they follow their training to put in the amount that they think is necessary. It's another reason why I think the distraction task is so important because the anesthesiologists can't tell what they're doing, whether they're playing a game or texting. They also were blind to all the hypotheses. But I, that was my initial thing was like, well, how do you know whether to give it to them? And they get very huffy, right? They're like, well, I spent 10 years in medical school. <laughs> this is my job. Of course I know exactly how much to give. So, okay. But we can enter uh, anesthesiologist as a random variable and it's not significant. So it turns out they actually do operate very similarly. Like they give very similar level of drugs. So it's based on the reaction of the patient? It's based on the reaction of the patient. They're anesthetized, so they literally cannot feel anything. You're dealing with, at that point, mostly anxiety and sometimes breakthrough pain. But breakthrough pain is relatively rare. So it's really about the anxiety level of the person. Great, so uh, I'll, I'll, I could talk a little bit about what I think is going on here theoretically, um, but I, I think I'll pause since we're at one and it would be great to get some questions. So in conclusion, I, I just, I think what I like about this set of studies and I thought you guys would find interesting is that we have a lot of, I think, biased assumptions about how text works and the need for nonverbal things to make human dynamics work. And I think it's pretty clear that we are attracted to texting not because it's addictive or anything like that, but because it's valuable. Not only because I can be quick and tell you where I am for lunch, but because it can provide all the psychological um, functions and benefits that real face-to-face -face social interaction can accomplish too. And so I'll conclude by just saying that I did an early consulting with Motorola where they were asking me to evaluate texting. And this is in the late 90s. And I gave them my analysis, but I concluded like, this isn't gonna work. Nobody will do texting because there's face-to-face. -face. People will prefer face-to-face -face for a whole bunch of reasons, efficiency and uh, psychological affect. So they never hired me back, and it turns out texting is now the most popular way of communicating with a phone, and it's because I was wrong. It's because all the things that we want and get from each other can be accomplished through text alone anyways. Thank you very much. Real test, it, as I see it, of your true underlying hypothesis, that is that language is sort of primary and we've been ignoring it for too long and so on, um, seems to me to depend on the next stage of technology. So when the next stage of technology is not just texting, but also you know visual and um, uh, haptic and, and yeah. so on, then the question will be, of those means of communication, texting, audio, um, and so on, now what will people devolve to? What will, they, yeah. what will they prefer? It's a really great question. The fact that you're finding you know, <laughs> strong effects from text is in part because you're using media that are text-based. Yes. 
Yes, I really hate it when people give me deep insights on the fly while I'm standing in front of people, but that's great. Thanks, Joe. Uh, you're absolutely right that um, the internet has been primarily a textual-based medium. I mean, in the 90s, certainly, 2000s, yes, and we're transitioning now to a, a image-based um, thing. So you're right, and this may be um, reflective of that. I'll say, two, I'll say two things. It nonetheless shows that texting is not deficient or verbal is not deficient, that we should pay attention to it. The second is um, that, yes, so we're doing online dating studies now, and there's an app called Tinder that's blowing everybody away. I'm sure no one here has ever used it, uh, although it's now very popular on online campuses. <laughs> yeah, how many, people, how many people here have a friend that uses Tinder? <laughs> Tinder, it turns out, the reason it's dominating the online dating market is it doesn't ask you all the usual about me questions like how much you love sunsets and beaches and things like that. It's all about the photos. And it turns out people can get tons and tons of information from the photos, more so than laboriously reading things. So I agree, we are moving to a photo image-based um, process, but it doesn't necessarily go against the central idea that, that language can still convey all this information. Yes? say that at least for some interval of time, uh, this kind of stuff can do what right. face to face stuff. Right. But you could, I mean, people pr managed pretty well without texting for, you know, centuries. Yeah. And if someone, and the question is left open that if you remove someone from society and they had absolutely no other interaction except through text, you think it would still work? Right. It's a great question. And it's more than centuries, right? We've been evolving with language. The most recent stuff from um, Levinson is about 450,000 years. So we're talking a long time. At least you know, well over 100,000 billion people evolved our language and social systems without texting. You're absolutely right. I think that's why we're in such a fascinating moment. It's easy for us to think this is just the way it is. It's not at all. That's why I think everything from these social psychological things are interesting to deception, right? Now, it's a really great question. If we were to remove everything except for the language and communication, would people be okay? I don't know the answer to that, but I do know a couple of observations. One, you guys are paying for me to come down here, right? We, as academics, go to conferences at great expense all the time. So there's something special about being together face to face. I don't think we know what it is yet. But it doesn't preclude the fact that this can also take over some functionality. It's not an either or situation. But at some point, we'll have astronauts far away from Earth, and they'll really only have these sort of things, and we'll, we'll find out. 2001 Odyssey doesn't suggest it will go well, but that's my best thought. Yes? Astronauts. <laughs> yeah, they'll have each other. Over here, then, Deb. generational question. When you do the studies and, and the interactive variables, I mean, I'm like you. I'm a Generation Xer. I came into the, you know, I lived in a world without it and then came into it. A lot of people in this room didn't. Do you find that there's a difference in your all your studies on how we, what what, what age we came into the game? Yeah, um, the answer is I, I don't have a systematic response for you. A lot of our experimental work is with students, so we don't have a lot of demographic variation. The Facebook study, there's tons of demographic ex variants, but I will never get to see any of that. Uh, that's like locked down now. Um, but I will say that. Uh, IRB people, they're so annoying. <laughs> Actually, no. I I don't know how about you, Pens. Is I think the IRB people are fantastic. Um, I do, I do, and they they receive the just the the, the worst of everything. Uh, but so when I talk about the ethical aspects of the Facebook study, I was saying this at dinner last night. When I talk to older adults, there's a lot of outrage and concern and shock. When I talk to younger people, it's like the exact opposite. I was telling them the first time I described that to a large group of students, they applauded spontaneously. They were excited that they knew a famous person. Uh, uh, infamous person, but I think that when I talk to them about it, they're like, how could you not know that you're being manipulated all the time, and of course this is happening. It's very much the way when I talk to older people about advertising. They're like, of course advertising is manipulating our emotions. They almost seem to have that experience in place. So there are demographic differences. I just haven't systematically studied them. Um, so going back to your claim on the emotional dynamics things about theory being important. Yeah. If I understand correctly, um, the Facebook theory was the exact opposite of yours, right? Um, so in that case, direction could be either them or yeah. you. Well, and right. Whatever you found in direction was going to be correct in yeah, some ways, right? Yeah, that's right. That's and, right. And I guess 
if you're working in a world where we our priors are completely untested and uh, perhaps ill-informed that whatever you find is going to be correct from a direction standpoint as well as from a statistical significant finding. Yeah, okay, so I, I see you saying, I'll just clarify, it wasn't Facebook's prediction, it was other people writing these social comparison studies that were predicting this. Okay. Facebook was interested. And they were concerned. That's where they were testing that hypothesis, and then I had this alternate one, and, and that's what they're testing. So you're right. So what I would do is I would go back to this notion of strong inference. And strong inference is the idea of making very explicit and precise hypothesis testing. Others have argued, and I think I would agree, that the reason biology, for example, or physics, has leapfrogged progress, say, in psychology or in communication is in part, you know, they have, you know, it's biology, they have evolution, but in part it's about the precision of hypotheses. So for instance, Einstein could say, well, I think that there's this relativity idea, and if that planet is slightly, is right there a little bit, or over there a little bit, like if it's right over there a little bit, it's wrong, if it's over there, it's right, period, because I can be that precise, that this kind of power allows us to make the same kind of strong inference hypotheses that we've lacked a lot. So how many times have you read in a journal like, we expect this to be different from that? And we can't make strong inferences from that. Here, social comparison theory says it must be lower, right? If they see positive affect things, they must have lower affect. And emotional contagion say exactly the opposite. Now, since I've been, so I think that's a strong inference thing. Now that said, do I think strong, or do I think social comparison operates? Yes, I do. I think social comparison, like if I have a really good friend and he has an awesome, amazing trip, I can look at that and be like, oh, I'm a little bummed I wasn't there, or he's on vacation and I'm not. What this does is it pits them together at scale and says ultimately what is the most powerful driver of emotional dynamics. <laughs> and because you can use strong inference with the scale, you can make strong predictions. That would be my, my argument. Yeah, so I would like to follow up on this because it's true that the big problem with um, I don't want to say big data, but with uh, scaling up experiments in this way is that it is very easy to find highly yeah. significant differences that are tiny in magnitude. Yeah. And then you said that's what, so the importance of, of theory. But I was thinking as I was reading, actually when I, was, when I read the paper for the first time, how does it contribute to prior efforts? And then the one experiment that came to mind was, not experiment, study was uh, Pristakis and Fowler's right. um, series of papers <coughs> on contagious on networks. Right which were very controversial for very, very different reasons, mostly because of the quality of the data. Right. And so it's not only that the theory building derives from being able to identify effects that we wouldn't be able to identify otherwise because you need a lot of data. Right. It's also that it, these kind of experiments allow us to think about the mechanisms in a more straightforward way. So in the Christelis and Powers <coughs> series of papers, the, the, the main weak point, and I'm a fan of those papers, but was the mechanism. What's, <coughs> what is allowing things to diffuse in, in this network given the way in which we reconstruct the network? And here, of course, you may be wrong about the mechanism that you're assuming, and for you, language is super important because it conveys emotions and that triggers reactions and so forth. Right. You could challenge that, but at least you have a clear idea of what the mechanism is, right? Right. And so, because the data is it's better in terms of the granularity of the observations, you can think of those mechanisms in a, in, a, in, a, in a better way, in a more advanced way. And of course, your mechanisms might be wrong. Right. And what Joe said before is super important, that language is just one of the symbolic mechanisms we have to communicate with each other, images is another. And so we have to probably think about mechanisms outside the box of how we have usually thought about them. But that's the big difference. Not so much the ability to identify small effects that are right. highly significant. Yeah, and that's one of the th reasons why that we were motivated to like, do this. Because Facebook was going to be doing this experiment, we could actually test Christakis and Fowler's work, which I liked as well, but was very controversial. Statistically, like huge statistical problems. Um, very small data, and so this was the first experiment of emotional contagion that was outside of a laboratory. Yeah. Yes? Um, so I guess I wanted to ask a question about trust and anonymity. Trust and anonymity, ooh, yeah, sure, great. That's how I get down, I don't know. Um, <laughs> it's, I mean, because you're making this incredibly strong claim about the value of text as opposed to language predicated on a difference between a face-to-face -face interaction, but it seems to me that there's some kind of assumption there that people are texting either always have, imagine they know who's on the other end or completely don't care. Mm -hmm. Because it seems to me that that's a huge difference between, mm -hmm. it's not just about language and the verbal, but there is some kind of sense when we're talking to people that we know with whom we're talking. Yeah. And it strikes me that that's not necessarily the case with text. Right. Uh, it's, it's a very big difference. I mean, for those 450,000 years as we were evolving, I mean, basically up until 1940, uh, over half of the world was illiterate. 1940 is when it tips over. So 
and for all of those people, they had to be in the same room with the other person at the exact same time for language to work. So there was a lot of uh, identity things that would be taken care of, et cetera. Now, it's not the case that when people are, say, using Twitter or doing a Facebook post in which it's not clear who your audience is, it's not that they don't think about audience. There's clearly still audience design. It's just been modified from the face-to-face -face environment. So it's not that I think now audience is just not part of the equation. I think it's just much more complicated. So one, night, one of my favorite studies from 2013 is a study that showed that we underestimate on Facebook our audience size by about four times. So it shows that people are making some estimates about their audience. They're just not very good at it yet. OK, but that Facebook and Twitter are different than texting. Yeah, well, texting, I thought you. About the condition where they're texting with the stranger, like what are they? Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, oh, that one. Yeah, or I see. Any kind of general texting. Because usually in texting, you know who the other person is. Well, maybe. No, I mean ninety-nine percent of the time. No. In texting. I mean, you imagine you know who the other person is. I mean, people. Can... Well, when I text my wife, I'm pretty sure that my wife's getting it, unless something weird's going on. Yeah. <laughs> you need to tell me something. No. Pranking. Oh, wow. no, it's pranking. No, there's no question that. That people love it, identity play, and there's certainly deception. Like I could talk a lot about that, but most messages, most text messages, are are absolutely true, right? So when we ask people to self-report their deception, you can look at every message and you say, was there anything false in this? Anything false in this? It's around 10% of the messages have something false in them. So that means 90% of the time you're receiving the truth, 90 to 93% for all of our studies. So I think there's a lot of truthfulness in, in texting. That's why I assumed you were talking about Twitter and the newsfeed, because those are non-directional. Texting is very directional. You know who you're talking to. You know who your audience is. But Twitter and Facebook, it's an algorithmically generated audience. And that's very odd. Yeah, I guess, I guess my, my trust in technology is a little bit different than yours. Because I guess what I'm trying to get at is that the way that you know who you're tech talking with mm -hmm. is very different than the way that you know who you're texting with. And that seems to me to be significant. I mean, you have to have a different kind of faith in a different kind of medium when you're texting than when you're actually looking at somebody. And I think that that undergirds still the ways in which we interact. I think people are differently careful about how they text or write emails than how they speak. But I don't think it's because of audience issues. So for instance, if I'm texting uh, a business partner that maybe I'm thinking I might leave or, or, or something to, when I'm texting them, I'm not worried about, well, is it, is it uh, Lou that's getting this text? What I worry about is when I say this to Lou, he now has a copy of it that is durable, searchable, copyable, shareable. Right? Those other affordances of media, I think, are much more important <coughs> than whether I think that message got to, to Lou. So I think those affordances are far more critical in terms of audience design than whether it's, he's going to get it. But maybe we could talk more about that, yeah. <laughs> Bruce. Hey, Jeff. Um, the second part of the first study, you had neutral feedback, negative feedback, and I was waiting to see positive feedback. Was there a positive feedback condition? No, there's no positive feedback. Just because for self-affirmation, you need to provide some ego threat. Are you thinking something would happen interesting with positive? Uh, if you were affirmed, it had this, a self-affirmation given to you, maybe you, wouldn't go to, maybe you don't need to go to Facebook because it, right. it seems that I feel bad about myself. I'm going to go on Facebook. Emotional cognition or a contagion makes it positive, which suggests that people are generally positive on Facebook all, most of the time, right? Yeah, I mean, it's a really good point. I hadn't thought about it. You would also imagine, you could imagine a scenario where positive feedback, they go online to share it, right? That's true, me too. Um, and I don't know if that goes against our self affirmation argument or not. Self affirmation is so about defensiveness. It's a really good question. You know, you get some award, are you more likely to go share that or not? Yeah. I was curious about yesterday you had mentioned that you had some additional slides or things about the kinds of emails that you got after yeah. the controversy. I know yeah. some folks may need to sneak out uh, for one o'clock engagements, but for folks who are interested, Jeff said he had a little bit of data around what happened. Yes, I realized that uh, I have that in another set. So if those need to leave, you're welcome to. I will judge you on the inside. Uh, <laughs> right, so I, I was telling Emily and Joe and Deborah and Matt last night that, um, okay, so the study comes out. Uh, the, for the first three weeks, it gets some minor attention. My career highlight was that Jimmy Fallon made a joke about it in his monologue. I was like, woohoo, great, done. Don't need to do any more research. Uh, and then uh, an article was published by Slate on June 29th that said the Facebook 
experiment that manipulated your emotions without you knowing. And from that point on, there were uh, thousands of articles written. Um, it's now the most, according to Altermetrics, the most attended to study of all papers published this year. It's the seventh most downloaded out of the 2.5 million that they have tracked. It caused an insane amount of um, controversy. And I think part of it is because we did, it was an example of a new type of science where social science and, and computational or big data met. And it, it led to a lot of concern, a lot of ethical issues. And as part of that, I received a massive amount of email uh, that I'll kindly call fan mail, but it was very clearly hate mail. <laughs> and I received two types. Uh, some was from academics, and I'm going to put those aside. And then the rest are from peop everyday people that use Facebook, and I've analyzed those to try and get some insight into, of course, you guys would too, right? Uh, into some insight into why this study was so controversial. So the first, here's a, a typical thing, is how dare you manipulate my, my news feed? And for me, this was an indicator of something I suspected, but was really shocked at, at how much of this matter, which is that people have no idea that the news feed is, is algorithmically curated. It's, to them, it's an objective social window to their world, perhaps presented chronologically or magically. It's not clear. Um, and I make a little bit of fun of it, but you know, we all get sucked into that belief of like, yeah, this is of course what I should know, but really it's a, an algorithm that's been cobbled together by accident by people over seven years. The next category, and I think that number one is the most, was the most important. Um, the second is this kind of thing. My dad's dad just passed away, and if I was in this experiment, I'd never have known. You can imagine getting that, you know, after you've been accused of being an unethical jerk. I'm like, oh my God, yeah, maybe I am a really bad person. But to me, when I read more and more of this category, it really is about the newsfeed is important. Again, this goes against the idea that social media is just this trivial, narcissistic, unimportant thing, but rather this thing that's seven years old, it's only seven years old, has become actually fundamentally important in people's lives. Now, whether they could get along with the news feed only, not clear, but it is an important part of people's social life now. And I think that's unequivocal. The third is something that in hindsight is very obvious, but that emotions are distinctly important. So you can manipulate some parts of people's life, like uh, whether they vote or not even, which Facebook had done a study and published in Nature a year before. Seems much more controversial than this. But emotions are about autonomy. And when we get to ethics in the Belmont report, autonomy is crucial to that. And I think this felt like a violation. Uh, and the last, the fourth category is I want to know if I was in your experiment. <laughs> and uh, I've never, ever in my life received that. Uh, and I got this a lot. And the conclusion for me is that big data experiments, paradoxically, are super personal. So when I do a study at Cornell, Cornell is up on a hill overlooking a little town. And there's a study, say I do one on deception, and that often gets media attention because people like deception and learning about it. It's about a study that was done by a guy on a hill. This study had 700,000 people in it, which feels like I could have been in it. And if I was in it, I'm really, really angry. And I want to know, tell me if I was in it or not. So these things which seem more impersonal because it's hundreds of thousands of people actually feel more personal people. It's about them. It's not about some abstract study on the Hill. And so those are the four things that kind of came out of the hate mail that I received. Yeah. Can you just clarify? Maybe I don't understand this. Um, there was no informed consent. Right? There's no informed consent for this. Why isn't it about the fact that there was no informed consent as opposed to all of these things? You might feel this in any study if you realize you were there. And also, just sort of curiosity, how did you write that up in order to get it passed by the IRB without having that? OK, so the first one is I could probably choose a better one than how dare you manipulate my newsfeed. Essentially, it's how dare you manipulate my newsfeed without letting me know. So there was definitely a, like, aren't you supposed to tell me? That came mostly from the. Uh, academic colleagues, most people that know about informed consent. Typical users don't have any real sense of that other than you can't do that without telling me that's, that would be the level of knowing that. So no, I think the newsfeed is manipulated and you mess with the newsfeed. That <laughs> implied, like you did this without letting me know. Okay. Um, okay, how did it work with the IRB was the second question. Right. So when uh, uh, Adam approached me and talked to me about doing this study, I told my IRB about it. And the IRB asks two questions. There's a couple other ones that are important, but the two core ones are, 
will you receive any data that could be de-identified? No, I never saw any data other than the ones you saw on the screen. I saw results. I never got any data whatsoever. Two, will you be um, part of the intervention, having any contact with subjects? No, Facebook is doing this study whether I'm involved or not. So according to uh, all the regulations, according to the common rule, everything, I was not engaged in human subjects research. I have a letter that says that, and that's the status of it. Secondary research from Facebook, which would not have been approved. No, actually, that's not true. Uh, well, the first part, you could conceptualize it that way. If you want to conceptualize this as secondary data, that's fine, because this would have occurred. I knew about it in advance. I tried to be very upfront about that. Uh, the second part you say is not true. So I think your point is that if we had run this through an IRB and said, well, we're going to do this without informed consent, it clearly would not have gone through. It would require informed consent. About three weeks after the study, the controversy, 33 bioethicists, bioethicists so these are academics, Bioethicists, PhDs, published a letter in Nature defending the study. And they said that the, this is totally overblown. Um, it's actually damaging to social science, to trust in science, and the way the media's report this is really problematic. Further, half of the bioethicists believed that this would have been approved without informed consent because it was minimal risk, as I described in my description of the study. The other half thought, well, no, if it went through, it would have required some form of informed consent or debriefing. My point here is not to say that for sure it would have gone through without informed consent, but rather that reasonable minds, scratch that, people with PhDs that study this can disagree. And so that actually was the first night where I slept a full eight hours for the first time after the whole thing. And in case I'm not being clear, this was absolutely awful. I received hundreds of emails calling for my Resignation, investigation, jailing, and ultimately physical threats. And when I got the physical threats, the police had to get involved. And then my wife had to have conversations with like, how do we you know, get our information off the internet so that our daughter doesn't get attacked? It was one of those two weeks where I've had tenure now for seven years. I'd never thought about tenure before, really. And it became very salient for me that it's too positive. Thanks to this, you said before in our meeting that you are being so there's all this yes. there's all this movement now to set up a set of rules or sort of protocols. Yes. Facebook is revising their internal yes. procedures. Microsoft are doing a lot yes. of companies that are doing things that they yeah. wouldn't have done otherwise. And right. so that's the positive I mean, this was uncharted territory. <coughs> that's right. And so you were the brave one who yeah. oh, one of the brave ones. <laughs> well not brave, uh, naive. <laughs> Naive, uh, totally naive. If I had known that this was going to happen, I would not have done the study. I, I, if, I wish I was a braver person and would say that I did, but no, I don't think I would have. Um, but you're right, Sandra, and I shouldn't come out totally negative. That period is over, as far as I can tell. And I've really enjoyed talking about this in terms of what does it mean for the graduate students in the room that are going to be doing this kind of work going forward, that want to collaborate with industry, want to do big data science. I just spent two days at NSF. We've been working on policies there, revision of the common rule. I was in Europe talking about this. And it's been really a positive experience outside of the you know, death threats and things. <laughs> Jeff, how did you manage this? How did you respond? Did you have some sort of system in place? Or did you sit there and respond to people or ignore them? I mean, Yeah, I, I, I ignored all of them. I didn't respond to one of these. Yeah. 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 Didn't respond to any. A question about the small findings, if you don't mind. Yes. Um, I mean, it's fascinating. I agree. The theory-generated uh, findings are much more interesting and allow you to explain that. Yeah. But can't one also say that there's noise in the system and that to some extent what you're looking at, it's possible that it's noise? Yeah. That it, and, and that the confidence levels are, are just statistically there and... and Chance. Yeah. Yeah. And then what do we do if it is, even if it's there, but it's so tiny? Mm -hmm. um, what made me think of it, and I had to think through, is the whole issue of nurture versus nature. And a lot of what you've been talking about today, in fascinating ways, bespeak the, a kind of sense that there is something autonomic in people's response to words that they have culturally embedded, but still autonomic, that they respond to. Yeah. But when you get to such a small amount of difference, mm -hmm. it really challenges that idea mm. and, and makes me think that maybe it is noise. Yeah. 
So um, I'll, I'll answer in two ways. The first is that you're right, it could be noise. And um, it's certainly the case with some probability that, that that is true. I think what argues against it is the full pattern of results. So for instance, if we'd seen that cross valence effect on one of the conditions but not on the other, then I start to get a little bit worried. But the fact that the data match the predictions for the four conditions and not some subset, and I'm not not hiding any conditions here or anything like that, this is the full experiment, uh, makes me more confident that it's not error. And if it is, it, it, you know, we, replication is needed, et cetera. To your other point, uh, why, does it, why does it matter? Uh, it's, it's a fair question. I think if you're thinking from a theoretical point, the answer is because we can move, advance our understanding of uh, what's going on here uh, really subtly. The other is, um, I guess it could go two ways. So one would be when you have scale, even small little effects add up, right? So Facebook now has 1.35 billion people in the network. And so even if you have this tiny, tiny, tiny effect, times it by 1.35 billion times network effects, which we're only starting to understand, but we know are exponential, there's potential there for real issues. Um, the second is if you think about what this study involved, it involved modifying the news feed, which was non-directive, right? So when we had our people in our lab, they're, email, they're texting back and forth directly. Here, uh, Victor could put something up about like a new paper he has, and it could be in my news feed, but it's not directed at me. It's this very lightweight sort of stimulus where, okay, so and then I don't see that one from Victor and I'm in the study. It's kind of amazing to me that you could still get the effect given how undirected and un, like such a low level of stimulus it is compared to their messaging back and forth. I'm actually talking to you. My full attention, both cognitive and emotional, is based on you. It's amazing that you get the effect anyways. I think maybe one more question. One more? OK, I think you have one. Uh, yeah, if, if I could return to this, I think there's clearly an ethical question that yeah. you've been grappling with. Yeah. But there's also, to me, a lot of a public relations question yeah. involved in all this. And, yes. and I think back to when I first saw this, I think it was in my Twitter feed. And it yeah. was people writing think pieces within moments. Yeah. Yeah. I saw similar things happen with the black Twitter study, which yeah. some colleagues of mine at USC uh, did. So I wonder, has this changed the way you think about presenting your work? Yeah. Um, and, and, and moving, and what's the role of more of a sort of public scholarship yeah. in the future of big data research? It's a really great question. Uh, I couldn't agree with basically your, your suggestions there. So um, we made hugely naive errors in writing this study up. We're, in the title is the word experiment, the word contagion, emotion. I mean, man, it was all the words that you would not want people to be thinking about in the public. Uh, and I regret that uh, because perhaps without it, this wouldn't have been a controversy. Well, I feel like some study would have triggered this, and ours just was the one. So yes, that was a major mistake. I mean, you talk to people A/B testing, as Joe was saying. Yeah, of course you do A/B testing. You want A or you want B? Both. You know, you need to know A or B. That's all this essentially was, and companies are doing this all the time. So the two parts is in trying. I'm trying to say this with avoiding like this sort of. Uh, deficit model, which I know is problematic, but basically saying I think that we don't have, as a public, we don't have good metaphors for what this is. So it, it sort of pierced people's shields. And I think journalists are struggling with this. Uh, how to describe it? What are these effect size? How do you think about something as small as this? And you know, I don't take this kind of view, but Duncan Watts has argued that journalists are in some ways feeling very uh, insecure towards Facebook and towards the way social science is moving. Journalists' job is, in some ways is to make sense of life for us and to tell our stories. And Facebook is moving into that role. And social scientists are moving into that role. So his view is that there is some dislike by journalists of this kind of study as it is. I don't take that. I, think, I, don't, I just don't know it well enough. Nonetheless, I think that as we develop these new techniques, both the, we need to bring both the public and journalists along as we understand what the ethical trip lines are as we, as we start working on this. Yeah. Thank you for the question.